Now let's return to that warning from the Children's Commissioner for England, who says that young people are being left to face the dangers of bullying and grooming online alone. Anne Longfield says children and often their parents have no idea what they're signing up to on social media sites and pupils as young as four should be taught about internet safety in school. Well, with me to answer questions you've been sending in are Eleanor Levy, editor at Parent Zone, a company which provides information to families and schools about their online use. And I'm also joined by Liam Hackett, who runs the anti-bullying charity Ditch the Label. Uh, welcome to both of you and thank you very much for taking the time to answer our viewers' questions. Uh, let's begin with this one from Suzanne Clark from Watford in Hertfordshire. My kids are on the PC at home all the time, day and night. I don't know what they do when I'm not around. I have to go out to work to pay the bills and put food on the table. I need to know how I can stop my kids coming ac across controversial websites. In an ideal world, we wouldn't get to the stage where children are seeing something that has upset them. What do you think parents can, can do to try to, to, to avoid that in terms of online controls and also guidance for their kids? Well, I think it's a very fine balance. And the feedback we certainly get from a lot of parents is the fact that they feel so overwhelmed by the pace of innovation with technology. I mean, we're seeing new apps and new social networks enter the market almost every other day. I think the most important thing is to have a proactive, open and honest relationship with your child to make sure that they know they can talk to you about any issues, but also to bring up their digital lives and experiences in normal conversation and to be proactive. But also there are some warning signs you can look out for in your child, such as sudden changes in behavior, aggression, lack of appetite. All of these could be key signs that your child is being bullied or is going through something difficult that they probably want to talk to you about. That's a really interesting point you make about bringing up your child's uh, digital online life in conversation in the way you would any other aspect of your life and I'm not sure whether people really have those conversations. Yeah, I mean, research shows that uh, one in three internet users are now below the age of 18. And, you know, when you look at the internet, it's so immersed around us. I mean, even your own fridge can be connected to the internet now. And I think we're now at a point where we're redefining the digital experiences of young people because the internet was not developed with young people in mind. But so many kids are active online now and I think it's really important to have those conversations. Uh, especially if, if kids are spending quite a few hours each day potentially online. Uh, what do you think, Liam, about these VPNs? Um, are there extra dangers posed by children using those? It's important to understand why they're using those. What are they trying to mask and what kind of behaviours are they trying to hide and from who? And I think that all, you know, it really does boil down to trust and open communication. I mean, in, in digital labour research, we found that up to seven in ten young people have at some point experienced bullying online, which is a huge issue and it has profound impacts. And we know that young people tend to use the internet to escape difficult and traumatic situations that they're facing offline, which is why online support services like ours are so important. Um, I'll, I'll pick up with the next point question from the Reverend Paul Farnhill, Liam, who says parents no longer have control of their children's internet access when they have a mobile phone in their pocket. D do you agree or disagree with that point? Do you know what I find so positive about this report is the fact that one of the key recommendations is to start teaching young people digital citizenship skills in school because when you look at the curriculum we have at the moment, we're teaching kids how to use and code software but we're not teaching them the social etiquette that they need to be able to navigate around the internet in a safe and humane and ethical way and I think as particularly as you get children as they grow older into the teenage years, they tend to see any sort of parental intervention as an invasion on their privacy. So one of the recommendations is to have this appear led where you've actually got older students educating and talking to younger students about typical issues and pitfalls of using the Internet and social media. And I think that's really important because it's not about restricting access to the Internet. It's about guiding carefully young people in the ways that they should appropriately be using it. Mm. Liam Wes G asks on Twitter, what makes you think schools are the best place to teach kids about online safety? I mean, presumably, presumably it's school and home, isn't it? 
Yeah, well, we see online safety as a societal issue, and this report definitely highlights that because this isn't about pointing a finger at schools or parents or anybody else in isolation. It's actually about saying, look, this is a real issue that we're facing as a society. The internet was not built around young people, and it's now time to redefine how the internet works to get a better deal for young people. I do think schools have a role to play in terms of education. Parents have a role to play in terms of the communication that they have with young people. But I think something that's often overlooked is actually the duty of care and the responsibility that is often overlooked uh, from the social networks. I mean, we found in our research that the majority of young people who actually report abuse to social media platforms are really dissatisfied with the response that they've received or not received. Often it's quite a lengthy process and the, it tends to be quite automated as well. And I think this is a, a real societal thing and it, it's great that we're having these conversations, but it isn't about pointing the finger at any individual stakeholder. It's about everybody coming together to work towards a mutual aim. That point you're making, though, about the social media and tech companies very much ties in with the idea that they should actually make their terms and conditions very clear, very straightforward to understand for young users. Absolutely. I mean, when you look at Instagram's terms and conditions, for example, uh, it's 17 pages long. You do actually need a postgraduate degree in order to understand it. And how do we expect young people to, to read something so long and to have an idea of the things that they're getting themselves into? In fact, as part of this report, young people are actually given a simplified one page version of Instagram's terms and conditions. And they were absolutely horrified at some of the things that they'd agreed to do. They didn't know that Instagram could be reading their private messages. They didn't know that Instagram was selling their data and their photos on to advertisers, for example. And I think the simplification of it is so, so important. And that's a question you can see there uh, that came in from Kay. You can see that on your screen right now. Well, it seems like the, the overarching message from what you've both been saying is just really getting that open and honest communication going, uh, whether it's in school or at home or amongst friends and peers. Um, so thank you both very much for answering those questions. Uh, Eleanor Levy from Parent Zone and Liam Hackett from Ditch the Label. Thanks again for your time today.